Thank you. So first and foremost, I'm also going to join the uh, previous speakers by thanking the organization of this wonderful uh, conference, but especially personally because I was new to the whole open social science uh, framework and, and thing. And I learned a lot as a uh, researcher by doing this uh, pre-registration chance and also the replication uh, task. So who am I? My name is Amélie Godefroy and I'm a researcher at the Center for Research on Peace and Development at the KU Leuven in Belgium. And I'm presenting a project with two friends and awesome colleagues, uh, being Fade Ida and Chase Adam Trojan. And so the project, this pre-registration uh, challenge, is actually uh, to introduce a new theory to robustly test it and then throw it away if it does not work or uh, hopefully publish it if it does work or publish it anyhow. And it's aimed at a better understanding in the dynamic link between threat and political attitudes. And so it fits a bit uh, with what we already heard today. So we experience a lot of threats in our daily life. So we can get soaked uh, by the rain or the snow nowadays, or sometimes we get sick, we have injuries. But we also experience some more collective, large-scale uh, group threats, being terrorist attacks, which is actually my main uh, subject of research, or uh, the wildfires we had this summer, but also previous summer, climate change, bridges collapsing in Italy, Florida, and so on. So then the very interesting research question or question is, what does threat do with our lives? And we've seen a bit of it. So one thing that all these threats have in common, and they're very diverse, but we normally don't like them. So we don't like to be soaked by the rain, and I really hope you don't like terrorist attacks, because then we have a different problem. So people try to solve them, right? We try to solve that arousal that comes with threat. And we look for solutions. So if it's raining, we just put on a coat, we take an umbrella, we go to the doctor when we're sick or have an injury. But for these other, other threats, we cannot do this on our own. So people look at politics, right, to solve these <laughs> threats. I really hope that politicians have an idea on counterterrorism uh, policies. Or nowadays in my country, like young people, adults and teens, they go onto the streets each and every Thursday to ask politicians to please do something about our climate. So politicians are part of the solution here. And then the question becomes, how do this threat impact our political attitudes? And a lot has been said about it, and I think the name most of you are thinking of now is uh, John Joss. So he's one of the most famous uh, scholars working on this. And his theory, and together with his uh, co-authors, is that threat has uh, various um, things that lead us to conservatism. And both uh, left-wing people, right-wing people, we will shift more towards that right-wing uh, end of the scale. And in the paper, he explains a lot of uh, motives that underlie this mechanism. And basically, it is that conservatism offers more uh, comfort, it's structured, it has an order, so it will lead to more conservative views. But of course, you also have the very famous terror management theory. It does operationalize threat a little bit differently, and I'm going uh, into detail later, but it says, no, 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 we're not all suddenly going to the right. It really depends on what we believe before. So if we are aware of that, and like a lot of these threats I have shown, they come with the possibility of dying, people will cling on to their own belief systems. And so it will make us more uh, believe in what we already believe, so we will polarize after it. And then my co-author, he thought, well, let's try to counter it and try really intentionally to make people more left-wing. And so in his paper, and it's like the main uh, basis of the project now, he really tried to like manipulate climate change, uh, healthcare uh, things, and he saw, yes, it shifts all people to the left. So both the people that previously were more uh, conservative and liberal, they both shifted more to the left-wing spectrum. So we could see it's a little bit everywhere. We do find uh, yeah, proof for conservatism, liberalism, polarization. So we were actually just having some beers after a conference. And I said, are we not talking about apples and oranges here? Because it reminded me a bit of your pictures. If we're comparing snakes and knives and terrorists, and should we not just think about what is it if we're talking about threat that we're talking about, right? And the same uh, for political attitudes. So the paper is based on two um, assumptions, you can say. We do see a very narrow operationalization uh, of threat. So if you look in the meta-analysis, the more recent 2017 of JOST, in the appendix, for instance, you see that the objective threat operationalizations do concern terrorism, mostly. 
Uh, the other ones are like immigration, crime, real law and order threats. But then terror management theory often is very individual. Like think about dying and what it would do with you and all the thoughts that come into mind. So it's very uh, on their own. And then Idai and Chang, they just manipulate left-wing threats. So there's something there going on. And which is actually interesting, if you look into the John Joss paper, the fair, like, there are four uh, measures of left-wing threats, and they do lead to liberalism. Uh, but it's not included as like a moderator in the meta-analysis. And then the other way around for political attitudes, it's often very broad. Like we measure RWA, SDO, and the C-scale, or whatever. But some studies already said, does it make sense? Like, yes, we like Bush, or we like Bush after the terrorist attacks, but does that mean that we also, uh, we don't want Obamacare later or whatever? So we might think about what attitudes we really, um, that really are going to change. So that's when the threat ownership theory came into existence. And I think it's a pretty straightforward theory, and I don't know why people haven't uh, read about, like, thought about it. But it's based on two main inspiration sources. First is the uh, threat affordance framework, and the second one, issue ownership. And like threat affordance says, like, we don't like threats, so we want to solve them. That's a very basic um, idea. And for these threats that I've shown you, you often look at politics. And in political science, there's a famous issue ownership theory that says some policy issues, they come with a certain political party owning uh, the issue. So some threats are also owned, and that's why we called it threat ownership theory, of course. So then the assumption comes that we think that any attitude change uh, after threat, and it's a political collective existential threat, will be contingent on that political party that actually owns the threat, or that it's at least perceived as more committed to it, more able uh, to fix the threat, and so the, the political party owning it. And that will be especially true for these policy measures that solve the threat like hawkish policy measures in times uh, of terrorism uh, and other uh, policy measures in times of other threats, so that we really have to be more specific also in the outcome variable. So that effect size will be larger than the general RWA uh, scales. And so political threats in which it's not really clear or that it's very di uh, yeah, uh, divisive, there we, will, we do expect a polarization. So then you can make a nice uh, kind of uh, model of it. So you, there's threat. Threat often comes with a clear issue ownership, or sometimes not. When it does, we expect uh, an increase in the uh, direction of the party owning the threat. And when it does not, we expect like polarization. But at polarization, uh, it's a bit the black box. We don't know yet and has to be tested. So we selected uh, yeah, some specific threats to, to uh, start testing this theory, being a terrorism threat and environmental threat. So in the case of terrorism, we do expect both uh, liberals and both conservatives uh, changing towards more right-wing attitudes, while when we uh, manipulate left-wing threats, being environmental threat, we do uh, expect a uh, sh uh, shift to the left. And then we selected infrastructure. We did have a lot of discussions about which threat we would select here, because we were thinking, for instance, gun control is very uh, yeah, a hot topic in the US, but it's not as applicable to the European contest. So we try to select a very neutral, not owned uh, threat in which we expect polarization to happen. So then the research strategy, and that's where the uh, pre-analysis plan, of course, becomes uh, very interesting. So here I am also going to be a bit open and honest about our choices. We did choose the United States, France, and Belgium because we are also American, French, and Belgium, so let's be honest about that, but also because they are really interesting for this theory. Being the United States, it's uh, very like polarized two-party system where issue ownership is often pretty clear. Well, that's not the case in Belgium. Like Belgium, it's an extremely messy political country with a lot of political parties. It's not even called Belgium. You have Flanders and Wallonia, so it's a mess. So it's really interesting to see, does this theory really travel across countries or is it maybe just a US American specific uh, theory? Then uh, we are planning, but again, we have some issues or some discussion here still to do a random sample uh, of convenience online panels. Um, but, and I would love your insights, we are thinking of doing a block sampling, giving the liberal bias of MTurk kind of um, samples. Um, so that's still um, up for discussion. And then we did a power analysis, uh, as you should, um, and we decided to have 200 participants per condition. And we did a power analysis based on one country, because we see them as replications from each other. 
And secondly, uh, we discussed a long time, like what prior are we going to use? Because it's a, it's a new setup. We, don't, we didn't have any study with five experimental treatments. So we took the one of uh, Ida and Chang because first it's, it's well, we, re we replicated basically, so it's the most similar uh, design. And secondly, it had the, the smallest effect size. So it was a pretty conservative uh, measure. And so uh, being, uh, yeah, using that one, it's also like bias and uh, uncertainty uh, correcting. We ended up with 1,000 uh, participants per uh, country. How does the um, experiment look like? So first of all, we have group A, and they're not treated at all. So they're really pure, pure control group, because often that is a bit lacking, especially in terror management uh, studies. So they get nothing. Then we do have the group that gets threatened by like food poisoning, food allergy, which is not political and an individual threat. So we uh, call that the placebo group. And then we have our three clear threats, well, political threats being the right, the left, and the unowned or unclearly owned uh, manipulation. Very important here to mention is that we really, really tried hard to keep it as consistent and as clean uh, as possible because there are already uh, big differences. So it's a newspaper vignette where the grammatical structure is exactly the same. So we try to uh, keep every word the same ex except like terrorist attack or a bridge collapsing uh, in order to avoid order and length effects. Also, we have the same human uh, toll because first we had only uh, one casualty. And then my colleague said, but who remembers the terrorist attacks with one casualty nowadays? So we increased that. So that's also the same for all uh, threatening um, vignettes. We have one picture, and it's the same in all three uh, threatening uh, stimuli because uh, we hope to increase a little bit of tension because people don't like to read anymore. So there's that. And also very important, and that was really important in the terrorist condition, we tr uh, try to make the culprit always national. So it's not an Islamic terrorist attack where you can have outgroup uh, effects, but we are going to check it anyway. Um, so that's that. And we stress that it's a political issue. And that was important for the bridge collapse because people think maybe it's an, a company that should solve it and that's not a political issue. So we really stressed like there's a um, family member of a victim stressing like, yeah, politics is not doing anything and there's so much more uh, functioning of bridges and houses, so there should be more policy about it. And we will test this, uh, that all threats are equally threatening and that the terrorist attack is not. Uh, Fadi did already a little pilot in the US, and there we see that actually all three threats are pretty, like, equally threatening. And also that the issue ownership is its own like we expect it to be. Um, because we, we base it on literature. What are we measuring in addition to the manipulations? It's, of course, the outcome variable, which are three uh, issue-specific ones. So terrorism, environmental, and infrastructure-specific. And then one general at, uh, RWA, uh, political attitude scale. Also, of course, the political orientation, because we do expect an interaction effect in that infrastructural uh, manipulated threat. We also have some covariates to then check whether or not we should do some weighting, whether it's a representative sample or not. Um, then very important, of course, the manipulation, exposure, and attention checks. And as you can see, for exposure and attention, we try to have kind of a scale of attention. So did they actually read it, so, or did they just skim through the survey, so the timer will do that. We will ask like how many people died and why did they die. And also important is the open-ended question because lately there are a lot of reports about like robots in MTurk filling in your survey, so to filter out uh, these a little bit. And then the classical please select the category uh, bad from the list below. That's what we are measuring. And then how are we well, going to analyze it? I think the most important thing, and it's a normally a clean experiment, so uh, Mankova should do the job, being that the uh, five uh, manipulations are the um, independent variables, the four uh, political measures, the dependent variables, and then we follow up, of course, with uh, the between subject and the contrast effects. Um, as our hypotheses are pretty like directional, like terrorists lead to right-wing threats, um, environmental to left-wing, we have one-tailed hypothesis testing, at alpha uh, 0 0.05, like we mostly do. Uh, and then very important about the data exclusion. Uh, I haven't said it before, but um, on the level of the participants, participants will not be able or cannot participate if they are minor, so uh, under 18, non-national citizen, and if they don't speak the language as their prime 
uh, their first language. So that will be in Qualtrics that can be filtered out. But then at the level of their data, um, so we decided not to delete too much beforehand because based on good practice, it can induce a lot of bias in your sample if you just delete them. So we will always do a, a like comparison. Uh, for the missing data, we will do list-wise deletion mainly in the main analysis, but compare it with an uh, imputation to see whether or not that changes results. The same with the screeners. As I told you, we do have multiple like attention checks, and um, so we will stratify it. Like if they fail one, what does it matter if they fail two, three, or four? So we won't exclude them just before. And same for the outliers. So they will be multivariate uh, outliers. We will also just check and compare what does it do and where uh, do we see differences? And if we do, of course, we will report it in the paper. We do have some follow-up analysis uh, written down in the uh, pre-analysis plan. It's mainly these robustness checks. So what does the uh, a different like approach to missing data, how does it impact my uh, results? Um, but also very important, we do expect it to run via anger. And that's where the emotions become interested. Because a lot of um, theories about threat, they imply that it's because we are sad and afraid and, and scared. Um, but we actually think it's more anger, because anger is a very like action, approach, revenge um, emotion. So that's uh, a follow-up analysis that won't be in the main paper introducing this theory, but that we can test uh, later on if we want to. So hopefully, uh, if it works out, we will test and falsify a new theory that might um, combine and explain some of the different uh, findings that we see in threat regulation literature. But I think also it has a great methodological uh, contribution because we do replicate some of previous studies in terrorism studies or FADIS uh, previous studies and we extend them. So they will be in the United States, uh, France and the US. And of course based on this amazing project, I think it's a very good way to um, show how to do it and we just want to introduce this theory. If it doesn't work, we can move on and we can do something else trying to uh, explain what is happening. So, and hopefully maybe it can inform like what does threat do with us and um, help us both uh, practitioners, academics, but also uh, policy makers in understanding what uh, do threat do with people. So, thank you very, very much uh, for your attention. I'm really looking forward to the questions and hopefully suggestions and especially uh, on the sampling because we are having a lot of debate, me and my two co-authors, about whether or not to block sample on uh, ideology, so on Democrats and liberals, and whether or not the power analysis is based on a two um, conditional um, experiment. Of course, we will do it on our pilot as well, but if you have some comments or thoughts on that one, it would be perfect as well to learn. Thank you. Yeah, and one of the really interesting thing about presenting such a pre-registered analysis is that if you actually do receive valuable feedback, you can actually use it to yeah, really uh, improve to your research, down. which usually you can you can maybe ex include it in additional footnote or something. And I also know that we you mentioned Just in your um, mm -hmm. paper, and I know we have at least one collaborator of Just here in the audience, so maybe he will jump Perfect. in. And uh, I know we have at least one question here. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I feel obliged to say something about of it. So I think this is re really well done. I think it's lots of details, and uh, uh, you know, I, I think we can all uh, learn from this. So uh, a lot of compliments for that. Uh, I think also the the puzzle that you raise is relevant. Um, I like the uh, as Julie already posted on Twitter. I like the the, the acronym as well. Um, <laughs> I do have a bit of a question about the mm -hmm. theory because you're yeah. you're drawing on on Petrosic and which is an issue ownership theory of voting behavior mm -hmm. and now you're tying ownership to issues and I, I, you might be right for slightly different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, the polarization to the left on certain issues might be the natural response to provide security. And that's so it's not a an ownership of the issue like Paul you're in your, also in your experiment the parties are not doing anything as far as I understand it's no. the issue it's issue polarization so if I get a leftist threat maybe my defensive response would indeed be to invest more in climate change uh, climate change protective measures that's, that has not so much to do with issue ownership 
uh, but more with what is offering security. Mm -hmm. And hawkish policies might be on terrorism, that might be offer me security. But that has not so much to do with issue ownership in my reading of that literature. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a minor detail, but um, then two suggestions on what you uh, propose in the experiment. One, I'm a little worried about uh, choosing food policy as a placebo condition mm -hmm. yeah. and then having water pollution as the leftist threat. Yeah. Uh, I would I would consider if that's a good if that if that is if and, and also why you would need the placebo. Um, maybe you can skip that because then you can also do a little bit more with your uh, resources. Um, and related to that, I do wonder if in the States people on, on, on water pollution are pre treated because uh, you Sorry, know, what are uh, uh, on water pollution, I think Lupia is not here anymore, but Flint, Michigan has been a huge national scandal, which mm -hmm. has definitely been so uh, based certain on groups. That. Uh, yeah, have been, but it it might be a uh, you might be thinking of looking at work by Cindy Kam on this. She done mm -hmm. work on 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 related uh, um, uh, uh, issues, which which have maybe a nice uh, twist to it. And if I can give you a third. The third is really a comment, uh, and that's regarding the exploratory analysis with the emotions. Uh, it will be confirmatory. So okay. we did uh, post a hypothesis, how okay. we think it, yeah, it would go, yep. uh, but it's not the main uh, okay. argument of this. Yeah. But there's, there are two thoughts there. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, one, drawing on Stanley Feldman and Leonie Huddy's yeah. work, you would actually have clear expectations of different directions for anger and anxiety. Yeah. And I would formulate these expectations and test them. Yep. Uh, and second, I would you know, there's a lot of you. You're, you are then using sort of a post-treatment variable uh, uh, as a con as a conditioning True. variable. Um, I would look at Koski imai sensitivity analysis. Uh, to you can pre-register yeah. that you do that, and you can also say if it then if if I my sensitivity analysis look not good, then I stop testing it. That's an, I yeah. think at least an advantage of pre-register. No, that's true. Great. Uh, I would I would. You yeah. can answer very, very quickly, but usually I would. Um, do, okay, then I would first uh, collect. No? Yeah. Okay, sure. So this was re w withdrawn anyway, so okay. go ahead. Great. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for the great comments. I think you're right on a lot of uh, things. As for the issue ownership, it's a really interesting perspective. Um, because, yes, like the two main assumptions were it's people don't like it and they are insecure about threats, so they want to solve it. And then we came with issue ownership theory, why we think uh, it would be in this direction. So I think we're just speaking a little bit different languages here. But yes, you're right, like issue ownership has always been on voting uh, behavior. But I do think it, it's all also, um, it can be also related on threat. Uh, because like, I don't know if hawkish policies keep us safe from terrorism. I actually would argue the other way around. But people think uh, that they do. They do think like, oh, they get their shit together, they will attack uh, the Batman and we will get safe. So it's really these perceptions. And that's also what we're testing in the pilot. Like, do, is, it, is it perceived issue ownership, like threat ownership? Do they really think that these people will uh, keep us safe from these threats? So that's what we test uh, in the pilot. But you are right. that It might be more that we should stress maybe more the insecurity and like the affordance um, assumptions, which is also in, uh, in the paper. Because that's the main point first. We do want to solve the threat. And then we came in a second step, like what will solve it? First, a party and then a specific measure. So that's how the theory is built up. Um, so yeah, great uh, thing there. For the food allergy, also really important. Um, we discussed it oh, so many times and mostly during the night because my co-author is American. Um, and I was actually the one really pushing forward for the control and the placebo uh, group. Um, because I think that threat is always oppressionalized without really thinking uh, about it. and. The issue ownership or the threat ownership theory is really about these political threats coming with a political party that might or might not solve it. And so the food allergy is really about for something very in, like specific, an old man eating nuts and he was allergic to nuts but he didn't know it. So it's really individual and it is still threatening. So we, are, we want to see it's not just a threat but it's really that political collective nature and then the party attached or not attached to it that is doing the job. And so in the poisoning, um, Vignette, it's always, it's really stressed, like we do not have uh, good uh, policies about it, like industries can just waste and dump their uh, toxic uh, waste into water, and so policies should really regulate that better. So it's always stressed that policy can do something about it. 
Um, so that's why I think it's still important to have like a threatening but non-political threatening condition. We are a bit thinking of maybe just slicing it and then combining it, but again, I am the one arguing not to do so because we do have a specific hypothesis and uh, thought about it, so they, they should have the same power uh, to test it. So that's why we kept it as five different uh, conditions. And then the Feldman and Hardy, yeah, that's true. Uh, so this paper took already a lot of time and a lot of words. So it's really on introducing this theory and testing like, do the main assumptions work? And like the anger and fear and sadness, sadness is the third um, emotion that we measure. Uh, it's now a little bit a side note, but we should maybe go more in depth uh, into that literature because you do have some very specific hypotheses that you can uh, test there, but indeed it's also a post-treatment measure. So that comes with that issue. So for this pre-analysis plan, we really wanted just to test this idea that we had. And I think it's a really great uh, way to do it that like detailed before you have your data. And if it does not work, it just, it won't work. And then we will report it like that. But I think this is one of the like most uh, straightforward hypotheses I've seen. Like Jeremy was talking about crazy hypotheses that like if I overlaid, I will wear red, which I'm probably not doing right now. So this is like an idea that I'm thinking, let's just test it. And if it works, let's build on that and then go further with the mediation and, and stuff like that. Oh. Uh, you mentioned there, there were different findings if you operationalized with political attitudes versus self-report versus RWA, SDO. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you go a little bit more in detail on that? Yeah, so um, maybe I should, oh, that's not possible. Yeah, it's not really important. But so what we see, it's actually very important to look at both um, sides of the equation. Oh, okay, great. So if I go back to the apple and oranges one, yeah. So that's really important. First is also the threats, and I think really that's our main um, argument here, that terror management theory is also always very individual. So that's already important to think about. That's why we do have the other threatening condition as well, by the way, um, to think maybe that there's already something there. But then about the um, broad, like conservative measures, I do think sometimes in the way we measure them, they are really a bit biased in how you, what you think you will find, especially you want to find that conservatism, are we all going to be Trump kind of effects. So, that's why I think it's really important to now think like, what do we really expect? We do maybe expect people to think hawkish measures will keep us safe and yes, you can uh, like search my emails and I don't care about my uh, privacy if it keeps me safe from terrorist attacks. So I think that's where uh, researchers should first look into and then maybe RWA. Um, we do like uh, hypothesize that it will still have an effect on RWA giving like the, the lot of tons of research that has been done but that the effect size will be smaller. That it will first be these measures that really will afford like, yeah, comfort you. And then the RWAs, SDO, C-scale uh, kind of measures as well. Does that answer your question a little bit? A little bit? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's a really cool uh, idea and design. I just wondered about the issue ownership uh, pre-testing or pilot testing yeah. that you're going to do. Great question. Um, so I'm on board with the polarization prediction. I think that follows. And I'm just wondering about the other two predictions, the shifts to conservatism as, a, as like a main effect, if you will, mm -hmm. and the shift to liberalism as a main effect. Right. Yeah. Um, what kind of issues... So you're assuming that like left-wing and right-wing people will both recognize the right as, as yeah, treating terrorism or some other issues. More serious. But... There's um, sort of work, I think, that maybe um, Bert was alluding to about, like from Kinder and Calmo, that says it's not about issues, but it's about identity. Um, and that's where the polarization thing would fall out. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering what issues you're, you're finding. Is it very selective on the issue for the other two predictions? Because a lot of really big issues will have clear positions for both parties and people will just regress to their identities. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, we discuss a lot about it. So we do uh, measure it in a very classical way in our um, like treatment uh, checks, being uh, there's a whole list of issues and we ask which party do you think is more committed uh, to yeah, solving this regarding of your own beliefs. 
Uh, and then which one is uh, the best in it or which policies do you um, well, agree that it, this will solve the issue? So that's a little bit already that, that associative, like we associate this party with it or I also really believe they are more competent in doing it. And then besides that, we also have their own uh, pre-ideology uh, belief. Um, we haven't tested it yet, so I don't have any data. Hmm? That's a very good idea because now, of course, we uh, base our issue ownership on the theories, like the, the voting uh, issue ownership literature that's out there. Um, we'll see. Uh, so I do think that we picked really clear uh, threats, and we are trying to make like more um, like scheme, like you say, to test more uh, issues, and then it will become way messier, I think. You're really right there. Uh, but still, I think it's interesting to test and see like which issues are uh, going where, and maybe it's not the ownership. Uh, maybe it's something else, and then we can uh, try to find out what it is. Um, and that's also why it's interesting to have these countries, because in the United States, it's always pretty easy. Well, not always, but to talk about. But in Belgium, it's really like if you think the Christian party is owning education, what does that mean? Is it a left-wing party, a right-wing party, a centrum party? I, no one knows. So then it becomes way messier to test it. Uh, but that's like first take the first step and then go and refine it. Um, but yeah. So we do test it a little bit, so we have it in there at least. Okay, uh, one final note is that you mentioned that, okay, maybe you will run this experiment and if it doesn't work, well then maybe the study doesn't get published. Have you heard of the in instrument of uh, registered reports? As in yeah, but have you seen my field in political science? We don't have that much journals. It's we true. I mean, I'm it facing is an the same problem, so but yeah, there, there are mixing, two. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's... Um, Nature Human Behavior, which does offer it, and there is a um, Journal of Experimental Mental Political, Political Science, Science, which and, actually yeah. fits um, quite well, quite I would well. say. Yeah. So I would really consider yeah. this. If you, yeah, but if you if you aim much higher in case of a successful, I mean, it's a trade-off. But well, anyway, so this no, is No, because I think it's really this. important to publish it even if we don't find it, because then it means we're just not on the right track and we can <laughs> move on and like think what is really going on there when uh, yeah, we face these threats. Okay, cool. Uh, I would actually go on to the next um, to the next uh, presentation. Um, oh yes, yes, exactly. <laughs>